Everything revolves around the relationship between Hashem and the Jewish nation. I'm starting from the beginning of Shir Shir, but if you can, if you see the Hebrew text on my screen, which I'm going to read and I'm going to explain it, uh, and I'm going to welcome comments and questions. What what I've started with is the Hakdama, the introduction of Rashi to Shir Hashirim, which oh. is very peculiar. In my physical book of Rashi, the the Hakdama is printed before Shir Hashirim. The introductory remarks of Rashi are printed before the text. On Safaria, these are included as part of his commentary to verse 1. Now, the peculiar thing is, there was a speaker who came to BCMH, I don't know, uh, some months ago, maybe a year ago, a woman from the Stern Yeshiva University community. Anyway, if you remember, if you were there at this woman's talk, which was really, really good, she talked about Rashi's commentary and the peculiarity of Rashi's commentary never having an introduction, okay? That in all the Sfarim, Chomesh and Navi, that Rashi writes his commentary on and Gemara's, he never includes an introduction. Whereas, all the other commentators, not all, many commentators write an introduction. Even those contemporary with Rashi, it's not just like a later invention. We have introductions going back to the time of Rashi and even prior so Rashi doesn't write an introduction. And so she, she asked, like, why is that? You know? And when she was saying this, I was thinking, but he does write an introduction to Shir Hashirim. So, you know, let's, I wanted to wait and see where she was going to go with it. Because that's the, for me, that's the peculiar thing. Is that Rashi never writes an introduction, but for Shir Hashirim, he writes an inter- introduction. Right? So what's that all about? So what she pointed out is, and she doesn't mention Shir Hashirim at all, but it fits perfectly. Look, look how perfectly. You could see from this that she nailed it. Like she nailed it. Why did Rashi doesn't write an introduction? She nailed it because this is exactly what Rashi is doing in Shir Hashirim. And she didn't mention it at all. So she may not have even been aware of this. But she says, if you read Rashi's first comments on every Sefer, they always have something to do with Hashem's relationship to the Jewish people. So she said that Rashi's first comment on the Sefer, on the first Pasuk, is his introduction. And his introduction always highlights the relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people. For example, in Bereshis, what does he say in the beginning of Bereshis? He talks about how the, the word Bereshis, and we mentioned this last week in the class, is a, is a very peculiar word. And the reason for that is that the word Reshis doesn't mean beginning. Reshis means beginning of. So what Bereshis bara means, Bereshis bara elokim, means in the beginning of Hashem created. Right? That doesn't make sense. In the beginning of what? And all the commentaries grapple with this. In the beginning of what? And they each have their answer. And Rashi gives several possibilities. But what he says is, no, you're reading it all wrong. It's not in the beginning of, biracious. The base doesn't mean in. The base prefix before the word racious, beginning of, means with. Okay? With something called racious. There's a thing called racious. And with this thing, with this thing, Hashem created the heavens and the earth. What is this thing, Rashis? He says, Bishviel Yisrael Shenikra Rashis. With Rashis means, Rashis is Yisrael, Rashis is the Jewish nation, as Rashi will go on to explain. And it was with. Yisrael, that Hashem created the heaven and the earth. What do you mean with Yisrael, He created heaven and the earth? Yisrael was not created. It means with Yisrael in mind. With this thought, with this conception of there's going to be a Yisrael. For that, I'm going to create Shemayim Ba'aretz. So, be racious. With racious, which is Yisrael, with that, Hashem created the heaven and the earth. Why is Yisrael called racious? 
Because in, in Yirmiyahu, I think it's Perak Beis Pasuk Gimel, chapter 2, verse 3 of the book of Jeremiah. It says, Kodesh Yisrael HaShem, Yisrael is holy unto HaShem, Reishis Tivuaso. He is the first of his crop, right? The first of his crop. Why, why is it called the first of his crop? Well, a lot of things that happened before, before Yisrael. But again, Sof Ma'aseh B'machashava Techila. It is with the end thought in mind that we begin the creation. Like Stephen Covey says in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I don't remember if it's habit one or habit two. I forgot already. But he says, begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. We say it in L'chadodi when we talk about Shabbos. Shabbos is the last day of the week. But it was with Shabbos in mind that Hashem created the first six. It was to get to Shabbos. Shabbos is the end point. Shabbos is the destination. Right? Between me and the Jewish people, the Shabbos is an eternal sign. The Shabbos is a joining of Yisrael and Hashem together. And intimacy. So Yisrael was the end thought. Hashem wanted to have a relationship with us. And with that in mind, He created the whole world. The whole world was created to have a relationship with the Jewish people. This is how she explained Rashi's comments to, to Beratius. It's I mean, this is the correct, this is exactly what Rashi means, no question. But in other words, she says, This is Rashi's Hakdama. This is his introduction to Chumash. Rashi's introduction is. Everything revolves around the relationship between Hashem and the Jewish nation. Next, the book of Shemos. The book of Shemos, Eile Shemos ben Yisrael, Haboy Mitzrayma. These are the names of the Jewish people, the people of Israel who came to Mitzrayim. And Rashi says, right in the beginning of Shemos, he says, why does the book start with Eile Shemos? These are the names of the Jews. You already told me. In Sefer Bereshis, at the end of Sefer Bereshis, you already told me that they came down to Mitzrayim and it counted them by name. Why are you telling me the names again? Rather what? To show you how much Hashem loves the Jewish nation. To show you how beloved the Jewish people is to Hashem. That He wants to, so to speak, count them again. He wants to say their names again. He just can't get enough of them. They're the apple of His eye. So... It wasn't enough that he already said one time the Jews. It's like, let me, let me go count my precious Jews again. These are the names of the Jewish people that, that came to Yisrael. And we find Rashi makes similar statements at the beginning of um, Bamidbar with the census and uh, why Hashem's counting the Jews and, and uh, the same thing because he loves the Jews like a person loves his coins. He's going to count them over and over. He knows how much money he has, but he has pleasure from counting them. Hashem has pleasure from the Jews. He loves the Jews. Vayikra, what does Vayikra mean? That Hashem calls to Moshe by name to show affection, right? And that's why Moshe made the olive small because he felt it was immodest to write a word that showed such a deep affection between him and Hashem. It's immodest. Hashem, can I write Vayikra? That you just happened, Vayikar from the word Mikra, meaning happenstance, you just happened to talk to me, not because we have a relationship. Do I have to reveal our relationship here? Hashem says, yes, you must, right? And Moshe says, but okay, fine, but can I at least try to hide the Aleph a little bit by making it small? And Hashem says, that you can do, right? Every single introductory comment of Rashi to the opening of a book of the Torah, and I, I didn't do a survey of all the Sifrei Tanakh, highlights the relationship between Klal Yisrael and the Jewish people, and this woman, I forgot her name, said that is Rashi's introduction. Rashi's introduction to every Sefer is, it's all about our relationship with Hashem. So now, with that introduction, it turns out there's one Sefer, <laughs> Where Rashi writes an introduction, and that is Shir Hashirim, the Sefer that is fully from beginning to end about the relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people. So 
in all the other Svarim, Rashi has to introduce with this idea. But when the whole book is, ab- is about this idea, so it needs a separate introduction. <laughs> um, it's just a, it's a funny thing to me that while this woman is talking about why doesn't Rashi ever have an introduction, and her conclusion is, his first comment on every book is the introduction. And the introduction always speaks about the relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people. I'm thinking to myself, Shir Hashirim is about the relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people. It's a one book of Rashi has an introduction. Now, I skipped part of the introduction in my notes. I, I left out of the first paragraph because in the first paragraph, Rashi outlines his methodology, and I'm going to summarize that. The, the reason I left in the rest is because, again, the text of Rashi and the wording of Rashi is so eloquent and so beautiful and so poetic and so moving that I, I really want us to taste the language of Rashi. But the first paragraph with his methodology, I'm just going to summarize it, where he says... The, the book of Shir Shirm is an allegory, as we know. And so an allegory has to be explained in two ways. Because normally, what does Rashi do when he explains the text? Everybody knows Rashi explains according to Pshat, the plain meaning. This is his intention as he outlines many places in his commentary. My purpose is to explain the plain meaning of the text. Okay, now everybody has questions on that because he quotes Midrashim up and down. And what are you doing quoting a Medrash if the whole, if a Medrash is really a, a, a deeper understanding or perhaps a non-literal understanding and you're trying to tell us a literal understanding? That's a question for another time why Rashi did that and it's a not completely different analysis. But Rashi reminds us over here that we have to explain the plain meaning. There's just one problem here. The plain meaning is a metaphor. So if I explain the plain meaning, you're just going to know what the metaphor is, but you're not going to know what the metaphor represents. So I have two jobs, says Rashi. I have to explain to you the meaning of the words so you understand the metaphor that is being expressed, that is being conveyed. And then I have to explain in the plainest meaning, simplest level possible, what the metaphor represents. So in Rashi, we are going to be hearing two layers of commentary. One to explain what Shlomo HaMalach is saying in his allegory, plainly. What is he expressing? What is the imagery? And then, what does the imagery represent? So we're going to, that's how Rashi begins. There's going to be two explanations to everything. Here's the, here we begin the second paragraph, which is on my screen. And he says like this, Va'omer ani, And I say, I Rashi say, okay? That's a very unique expression in Rashi. That means this is not something he learned from his Rebbeim. Another fundamental thing you need to know about Rashi's commentary is that it's almost exclusively things that he learned. There's, there's, there are essentially two styles of commentary that we find in the period of the Rishonim, the early commentators. The earlier Rishonim, the, the earlier medieval commentaries have a style of what you might call Mesora, and that is they're giving over what they learned by tradition from their teachers. So we're receiving information that they received from their uh, forebears. Around the time of, and that includes the Gemara as well, Rashi's more or less giving over the way he learned the Gemara from his teachers. When you get to Tosfus, Rashi's children and grandchildren, you will see a switch. It is not a Mesorah type commentary, it's an analytical type commentary, meaning they will analyze the text and by finding difficulty in the text, they will innovate new approaches that haven't been suggested before, a novel approaches. So we go, we bridge from Rashi to Tosis, we bridge from kind of a received tradition of the explanation to uh, novel, novel expressions, novel, uh, uh, innovative interpretations. Rarely you'll find in Rashi, but you do find it, the expression Omer Ani, or in this case, Ani Omer, I say. I say means this is not something that I learned, this is something that I'm conjecturing on my own based on my own analysis, okay? So uh, 
uh, we're going to see another part of Rashi's introduction that I skipped, as he said that basically he read like a million midrashim, and they were kind of all over the place. So what his work has been to do is to pull a line of medrash here and a line of medrash there and weave each one into its place in the text to make sense according to the plain meaning. So you see already Rashi, his style is to bridge the medrash and the plain meaning together. He doesn't see a conflict there. Um, it just needs to be filtered, is basically what he's saying. So a lot of what we're going to hear from Rashi is based on Midrashim. But here he's telling us, this is my personal view. Okay? Ve'omer ani, she'ra'a Shlomo beruach hakodesh, that Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, who authored this work, he saw with divine inspiration, with the Holy Spirit, she'asidin Yisrael Liglos Gola Achargola or Ligalos Gola Achargola. He saw that the Jewish people would go through exile after exile. Churban Achar Churban. Destruction after destruction. Ulehis Onen Begalos Ze. And they would mourn in this state of exile. Al Kivodam Harishon. They will mourn over their former glory that they had in the time of Shlomo. Remember that Shlomo reigned over the most prosperous period in Jewish history, perhaps certainly in the first temple, but arguably through both temples because in the second temple, they were almost always under someone else's rule. They were always under someone else's thumb, first the Persians and then the Greeks and then the Romans with a very brief respite under the Hashmanoim after Hanukkah, and it wasn't fun and games, it was just all war and bloodshed. So Shlom HaMelech reigned over the most prosperous time in, in Jewish history, and he could have stood there and sat there and say, this is it, we've made it, we're at the top of our game, you know, things, things are perfect right now. And yet he understood deeply through his Ruach HaKodesh that things would not remain this way. There would be an ebb and a flow, there would be good times and there would be bad times. And I don't know if even last week when we had our virtual class or the week before or the weeks before that, any of us could have imagined the state that we would be in, all of us here tonight, right now, uh, in a world that is shut up indoors because of a danger lurking everywhere uh, that is taking many, many lives and threatening many more. And we don't know when this is going to end. And we don't know how it's going to end for us with our, our well-being, physical well-being, our financial livelihood, that of our, our society, the country, uh, the world. I mean, we're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a tremendous precipice. I don't think anyone pictured 30 days ago in our, in our world of, pl of plenty and bounty, and prosperity, and technology, and medical know-how, uh, and medical advancement, and scientific advancement, that any of us would ever in our lifetimes experience what is happening right now in the world, right? In the blink of an eye, with the snap of a finger, things can change, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a reality, that's a fact of life. So here's Shlomo HaMelech, and he's sitting on top of the world, in a manner of speaking. And he's like, he, he could have just ignored the way of the world and said, things are good. But Rashi tells us, no. In that time, he saw that things were going to get bad later. Okay? And they would pine away for the former glory, the glory of Shlomo, which has never been achieved since. Somehow he knew that the Jewish people would look back at him and say, if only we could have had it the way we had it then. So he is writing this for all of us in all ages as a beacon of hope for the dark times that we may experience as follows. So she is pining, uh, rather, the, the Jewish people. He hasn't talked about a she yet. The Jewish people is pining for their former glory. Velizkor Chiba Rishona, and she will remember the original Chiba, the original affection Asher hayu segulalo mikola amim. How she, I'm saying she, but the Jewish nation, was treasured by Hashem from among all the nations. 
Lamor, and she will say this. And the, Rashi now quotes a Pasuk in Hosea, and we're going to see this consistently throughout Shira Shirim, where Rashi will reference passages in the books of the Nevi'im, particularly those that also just sort of periodically and anecdotally express the relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people as man and woman, as husband and wife, as a familial relationship. So Hosea does this as well in the second chapter, where he says, Eilecha ashuva el ishi harisho. Let me go and return to my original husband. What does that mean? We'll see in a moment. Kitov li az me'ata. Because it was better for me then than it is for me right now. Now you'll notice that I highlighted this in yellow. And I have a little bit below it this yellow bit over here. Okay? So I made a note for myself what the context is in Hosea. So it's, it says that it's talking about Hosea is also depicting the Jewish people as a woman and Hashem as her husband. And she is unfaithful to him. And she goes chasing after other lovers. It says, but she doesn't, she doesn't achieve with them the love that she's seeking. So the Jewish nation, in other words, is being unfaithful to Hashem, that is. They are pursuing other ideologies. They're pursuing the ways of other nations. They're pursuing alliances with other nations. They are trying to ingratiate themselves with other nations and say, look, we could be just like you. And they were hoping somehow that in building these relationships with other nations, they would find a joy and a pleasure and a fulfillment in their existence that they weren't having on their own, right? Because the Jewish people were a lonely nation. We're not like others. We stand apart from others. It's a very difficult position to be in. And yet, the Navi tells us, she doesn't achieve this love. She doesn't find it. She's left feeling empty and miserable. And that's a parable for the suffering that she undergoes from her enemies and also from the calamities that come upon her as a result of her abandoning Hashem. And she realizes it was a big mistake. I had a great husband and I abandoned him for fleeting lusts that led nowhere and were ill-conceived. So she um, now decides, I, I made a big mistake and I want to go back to my husband before. So that section of Hosea, Rashi says, is kind of emblematic of the theme that Shlomo was conceiving when he, when he composed Shir Hashirim. So, uh, so here, continuing, on the, in the green section here, says, V'yizkiru as chasadav, she's going to remember when, when she abandons Hashem and, and, and ends up miserable and empty and alone. She's going to remember chasadav. She's going to remember Hashem's kindnesses. as ma'alam asher ma'alu. And she's going to remember the betrayal that, or Israel here, will remember the way they betrayed Hashem. So the part of the misery will be, and this is something I've spoken about before, and we're going to see it again in Shir Hashirim. Keep this in mind, very deep, important concept. Part of the misery that the Jewish people will feel, it says, is how good Hashem was to her and how undeservingly she behaved. So that even the good things become sources of pain because... I'm so undeserving, I'm so ashamed of the way I acted when someone was being so good to me and I could be so rotten. So that the goodness, the chasadim, the kindnesses, become a source of shame. As we said that the word chasad means both kindness and shame, and that's why. Because one, in a certain way, an undeserved kindness does lead to a sense of shame and internal pain. Blue section here. Not only will she remember what was once the good that she had and she blew it, right? Or as, uh, as uh, Shoeless Joe from Hannibal Mo says in the Broadway show, he says, A man doesn't know what he has until he loses it, right? When a man has the love of a woman, 
he abuses it. So, but here's the other way. It's the woman to the man was, was improper. So not only will she remember the good that she had and she blew it, but also, she'll think of all the good things that were promised in the future, in the time of Mashiach, when we're going to be reunited with Hashem. And we don't have those things now either. So we're in this awkward, in-between period of, I had it so good and I blew it. And I can't wait. I wish, I wish, I wish I could get back to what I had or that I could achieve what I'm ultimately destined to achieve. And right now I'm, I'm in that dark in-between place, that very undesirable place. So she's miserable and all she can think about is what was before and what's yet to come. Okay. So that is, that is the framework that Shlomo is coming from between Hashem and, and the Jewish people. Rashi continues, he said, So he composed this book with divine inspiration, with the Holy Spirit. In the terminology of a woman who was bound, remember the word srura, we had it in the tefillah, she's bound, with, she's a living widow. What does it mean to be a living widow? A, a widow is by, by definition You're living. But it means a widow with a living husband. Meaning, if she's a widow, at least she could get remarried. But if her husband is alive, she can't be, be remarried. So she's living the life of a widow as though she has no husband. But yet she's still bound like an aguna. She's still bound to her husband because she has no one else that she could be with. So she's like all alone in this seemingly unending misery. Now Rashi points out over here that R Shlomo wrote this book in Ruach HaKodesh in terms of a woman. Now, why does Rashi have to point this out? Because, and, and I hope I don't make anyone blush over here, but the, the language of the, the Shir HaShirim is so intense in its description of the loving relationship between these two that if you didn't know better you might say this is erotic poetry so Rashi's making the point that this language of describing a woman this isn't just you know some racy raunchy uh, um, uh, poetry this is holy words inspired by God himself, and we need to approach it with the requisite reverence, okay? Moving on. Now, she is, she is like we said, she's in this state of kind of a, an unending widowhood. Mishtokekes al-Baila, she is pining for her husband. Misrapekes al-Doda, she... Uh, uh, desires and misses his love. Mazkeres ahavas a love. She will bring up mazkeres. She will make mention of. Um, uh, uh, she'll make a, 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 a mention of a reminder of her, the love of her youth to him. Mazkeres ahavas a love. The love of she's going to talk about the love of her youth for him to him. Umode al and she will be mode. We literally modim. Mode means to confess. Like we said, it means to thank, to acknowledge, to confess. She will confess her sin. I was wrong. I was wrong. I was terrible. I did these terrible things. So now, Afdoda, so too her lover, that's Hashem in the allegory. Tsarlo Bitsarasa. He too is pained by her pain. So important. Listen to these words. It has come up many times in our series on Tefillah. Hashem is pained by the pain of the Jewish people. Tsarlo Bitsarasa. He is pained by her pain. Umazkir Chaz De Nehureha. And he brings up a remembrance of the kindnesses of her youth. Vinoy Yofia, 
uh, the aesthetically pleasingness of her beauty. V'chishron pa'aleha, and the uprightness or the fitness of her acts. So I put these three phrases in three colors because I think they're all important. It says that Hashem is going to feel pain for her pain. But then it says he's going to rem remember or make remembrance of three things. The kindness of her youth, her beauty, and the uprightness of her acts, the fitness of her acts. Okay, what are these three things? Let's start with kindness of her youth. What do you suppose that is? What is the youth of the Jewish people? Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. The kindness of the youth um, is what we would call zechus avos, the merit of the fathers. That there is a memory of the olden days, the, the early years of the Jewish nation, which may include Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Because of them, even though at present our actions are not pleasing, but Hashem still loves us on the basis of the relationship that He began with our forefathers. And, and on that basis alone, Hashem will act kindly to us, or with mercy. At the very least, He'll act mercifully to, to us. Now, another thought I had about it is, you know the song, everybody loves this song, right? Koyomar. Right? Zocharti loch, I have remembered for you, chesed neurayich, the kindness of youth. These are exactly the words that Rashi uses here. Umazkir chasde neureha. Zocharti loch, chesed neurayich. I have remembered the kindness of a youth. What's the kindness of a youth? <speaking in Hebrew> the love of your kilulo sayach, the love of the days when you were a kala, the love of the days when you were a bride. What are we describing? This is in Yermiyahu. This is a pasuk in Jeremiah. Jeremiah says to the Jewish people, Thus says Hashem, Koyamar Hashem, I have remembered for you the kindness of your youth, the love of your days as a bride. When you followed after me in the desert. In the land that was not sown, was rua, wasn't sown, wasn't planted. You went after me in the desert, in a, in a barren land. You were in Mitzrayim, a very fertile land. And with no, essentially no provisions, you followed my word through Moshe Rabbeinu. Come, follow Hashem into the barren desert. He's going to provide for you somehow and bring you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Fantasies. It sounds like fantasies. And you said, I believe. I, I have faith. I trust Hashem. I will go. I will listen. Now those who didn't, we know what happened to them. But, but the Jewish people, at least some portion, right? said, I will follow. And that was a chesed, that was a kindness, because it wasn't earned, meaning you could argue it was earned, but in other words, you could make a rational argument, that was a crazy thing to do. So to dedicate ourselves to Hashem in that way was, was really going above and beyond expectation. So Hashem says, that kindness of your youth, because of that I'm going to remember, and I'm going to have mercy on you, and I'm going to, I'm going to redeem you. So that's number one, chesed nehurah, the kindnesses of her youth. It's the, the merit of the fathers or the merit of the Jewish people in their early years coming out of Mitzrayim. And it says, Vinoy Yofia, her aesthetic beauty. What is that? Any thoughts? My thought is, Vinoy Yofia has to do with intrinsic 
intrinsic characteristics that are of of high caliber or high quality, okay? Um, for like like you might say, like good midos, like it says, Simanei um, Yisrael, Uma Hakadosha. The Gemara says there are three simanim. There are three signs of Yisrael, the holy nation. And what are they? Baishanim, they are bashful, they're humble. Rachmanim, they are merciful. Vigomale chasadim, and they perform acts of kindness. So those are the three, those are the three signs of Yisrael. If a person is humble, a person is merciful and a person is disposed toward acts of kindness, if you find those qualities in a person, you have reason to suspect that they have Jewish ancestry. And if you find the opposite qualities in a person, you have reason to suspect that we, we need to find out where this person really comes from. So the, I believe Noi Yofia, her beauty, her physical beauty, is sort of like her chiseled characteristics, meaning her innate characteristics, and we're talking, of course, on the spiritual level. Uh, another another example of this is what we had last week, which I didn't I didn't really fully go into, but I will now because it's really good. You may remember last week when we did Modim de Rabbanon, the Modim of the rabbis, the Thanksgiving of the rabbis, that we said that there were several opinions in the Gemara what should be said by the congregation while the chazin is, is repeating modim, right? And a whole bunch of different things are offered. And in the end, we add them all in. We put them all together. We stitch them all together. And that's the modim de Rabban and the modim of the rabbis. But there were two phrases that everyone agreed on. And that's the opening phrase and the closing phrase. Everyone agreed you should start with modim anach nulach. We are thankful to you. And that we should end with Al Sha'anu Modim Lach, because we are thankful to you. And then filler. So if you took out the filler, what we're saying is we are thankful to you because we are thankful to you. What does that mean to be thankful to you because we're thankful to you? We said whatever we said last week. What I didn't share with you was what Rashi says in the Gemara there. It's a Gemara in Sota, Daf Mem, Ahmed Aleph. Rashi says, we are thankful to you for giving us the quality of desiring to be close to you through our expression of gratitude. And we said that the, the, the so let me, just, let me just fully reflect on that. Rashi pronounces we're thankful that we're thankful, meaning the fact that I have an innate sense of gratitude is a quality that you imbued in me, Hashem. That is a quality that I have innately. And so when we got to the end of the brach of modim, the regular modim, we said, Baruch Ata Hashem, blessed are you Hashem. Hatov Shimcha, your name is good. Ulecha na'e lehodos. And to you it is na'e, that's from the same root as this word here in Rashi, noi, meaning beauty. To you it is beautiful to give thanks. And we related that to that sort of innate yearning of a person to express gratitude. So that's what I think over here is going on when Rashi says, Vinoy Yofya, he will remember, Hashem will not only remember the kindness of the youth, which we just discussed, but also Noy Yofya, her innate good qualities. The innate good qualities of the Jew, even if externally and presently the Jew is misbehaving. But deep down, every Jew is beautiful. And we're going to see this expressed openly in Shir Hashirim, in the lowest, darkest, dirtiest times of the Jewish people, how Hashem will still be able to see the beauty of the Jewish people. We'll see it in, in the text when we reach there. Okay, so kindness of the youth, beauty, beautiful characteristics, and the chishron pa'aleha. And the, that's from the word kasher, meaning fit, fitting, appropriate. The fittingness of her acts, of her deeds. What is this referring to? I, th I think this is the easiest one. 
So I think this is pretty plain that this is just, these are, these are our deeds. These are our actions. Meaning, um, th there are good things that we do. So even if we're not relying on our innate characteristics in the absence of action, and we're not relying on the kindness of the fathers, the merits of the fathers, in absence of our own action, in the end, we still have our own actions, our own positive actions. Arguably, there isn't a Jew on earth who doesn't do some good things, even if they are lacking in other areas. And it's very important that we recognize that. You know, it's very easy to criticize and it's very easy to judge and it's very easy to look and say, that Jew isn't observing this set of halachas or that set of halachas. But how about acknowledging the good things that they do? Because there's certainly many of them. And if we, we probably wouldn't need to look far to find if we wanted to. And I'll bet we could find in the same people that are, we, the same people that we might easily criticize, we could find things they do that are good, that they do better than we do, you and I. I think, I think we could all agree that that's true. And that's the perspective that we have to have when we look at other people. And Shir Hashirim will tell us, and Rashi's only cluing us in, but we'll see this in the text as Rashi flushes it out, that that's exactly how the, Hashem looks at the Jewish people, is even when we're bad, we're still good. Okay? So... We have Kishon Pa'alaha. At the end of everything, we still have good, positive, attractive acts that, that Hashem finds beautiful in us. Okay, so now, listen to this, listen to this. Bahem, through them, through these characteristics, the kindness of the youth, the beauty, and the uprightness of acts, through these things, Nikshar Ima, he is bound to her. Be'ahava Aza, with a fierce love. Hashem loves Yisrael with a fierce love. Ahava Aza, Az Kanamer, bold and brazen like a tiger, right? Ahava Aza, it's a very strong love that Hashem has for the Jewish people that's built on these three pillars. Uh, right? And what does Shlomo HaMalach also say? V'hachut ha-meshulash lo bim take. The threefold cord is not easily broken. The chut ha-meshulash, the threefold, not easily broken. Lo bim take. So here Rashi has woven for us a threefold cord. The kindness of the fathers, the beauty, the innate beauty, and the, and the fittingness of the acts. For that, Hashem is nikshar. He's bound to us. Nikshar, like tied. Like tied with a cord. Hashem is tied to us aza, with a fierce love. It's not easily broken under any circumstances, even the worst circumstances, chas v'shalom. Lahodia, and He's going to let her know, lahodia, to inform her. Ki lo mili bo'ina. He's not expunged her from his heart. Velo shiluchaha shiluchin. Her shiluchin, her, her having been sent away, that's another uh, synonym for divorce. Shiluchin, that's what really the Torah calls, you know, shiluchin, that's sending away, meaning divorce. Velo shiluchaha shiluchin. This seeming divorce between Hashem and the Jews that He sent us into exile, it's not... It's not, we're not truly sent away. We're not really divorced from Hashem. Chas v'shalom. Ki od hi ishto, she is yet his wife, vehu isha, and he is her husband. Vehu asid lashuv eleha, and he will return to her in the future. Right? Lehodia, he's informing her. This is the content of Shira Shirim. I love you. I've never forgotten you. I never will forget you. You will always be my wife. I will always be my husband. And we will be together again, I promise you. And that is how Rashi concludes his introduction. And following that, we have the beginning of chapter one. Okay? So tonight's class has been 
Rashi's introduction to Shir Hashirim. I hope you're feeling fired up, you're feeling inspired. Not by me, by Rashi. I'm so inspired by Rashi. I read, I read these Rashis on Shir Hashirim and I'm just like, I don't know. I, I just, I'm all warm and bubbly. I can't handle it. I just love it. So these words of Rashi make me really excited. Um, I hope you feel the intensity in Rashi's words and you're excited to continue next week. Let me let me go count my precious Jews again.